Hello, BFRB community. I'm Jen Monteleone, the new interim executive director of the TLC Foundation. It is so wonderful to be here with you today, and I'm super excited to have this amazing conversation about the BPMI Research Project with Dr. John Passantini from UCLA and Dr. John Grant from the University of Chicago. Thank you both for joining me today. Thank you. This is going to be an informal conversation. No slides, no graphs, no data points. We're talking about the process, the people, and the groundbreaking research that has been discovered thus far. How those research results inspire hope and empower healing and where we go from here. If you have any questions after viewing our conversation today, please email them to info, I-N-F-O at BFRB.org. And with that, let's start our conversation. So with me being new here, it would be helpful to know more about what brought you each to this work. Whoever wants to go first. Well, um, I can go first. Um, I, throughout my career, I've been interested in um, developing effective treatments uh, mostly working with children and adolescents, but, um, you know, also working with adults. And I got interested in OCD early, early in my career. And um, working with OCD, that naturally brought me to, um, introduced me to the world of Tourette's disorder and tics, because OCD and tics go together. Um, and anxiety disorders, because people with OCD and tics have anxiety also. And not too, not too long after that, um, to the BFRB world, because these disorders all tend to go together. OCD, tics, Tourette's, BFRBs, anxiety. It really, they really all rotate around the same function of having a, a bad feeling, a distressing or, or, or upsetting feeling, like a tick urge, an OCD um, obsession, a BFRB urge to pull. And then doing something to make that, that feeling go away, either to make oneself feel less bad or more better. So it was really just kind of a natural progression coming into the BFRB world. And um, I've been with uh, on the scientific advisory board for about 20 years now. And the reason I stay and the reason I do the work is because of the people. It's an amazing organization and it's amazing community. And um, every time I feel tired or like I don't want to do it, I go to, I go to one of the conferences and I'm good for another year. <laughs> Dr. Grant? Yeah, you know, my, my uh, story is a little bit different. Um, when I went to medical school, uh, my goal was to go into OCD research and treatment. And I actually told my mother this. And my mother, who was a, a grade school teacher, told me that that was absurd, mm -hmm. that what I needed to do was go into trichotillomania research and treatment because she had had so many kids that so bothered her that she didn't know what to do with as a teacher that mm. she said, that's what you need to go into. And so, you know, not that I do everything that I was told, <laughs> but I, uh, uh, then I started doing research in the world. And so I, um, I've never looked back. I mean, I, I find it very satisfying as, as John has mentioned. Um, I, I love working with these folks. Um, and even though uh, they struggle and as clinicians, we struggle with knowing what's best to do for folks. It's always a satisfying and oftentimes a very rewarding uh, experience to have, so. Thank you both for sharing more about your background. So why is the BPMI project important to this community? And what have we discovered thus far? Well, I can start. Um, I think, so think back, you know, 30 years or so even. Um, we've really had one approach, right? We had, we've had some version of habit reversal, which people try all the time um, as a therapy. And we started looking at antidepressants um, as if they would help BFRBs in the same way that they would help OCD. And the antidepressants really weren't that helpful and habit reversal was kind of helpful for some people. And this is the way that we've plotted along. Something may help one person, something may help somebody else, but then all these other people are not helped. So it was never 
something was wrong here. I mean, this was, I think, the, the state of things before um, we as a scientific advisory board as part of, of TLC Foundation said, well, you know, maybe there's something about BFRBs that isn't as straightforward as we think. Maybe sort of a one size doesn't fit all approach. Well, that's lovely in theory, but then you have to know how many sizes are we talking about? Mm -hmm. And so one of the, I think the, the mission, initial mission of, of the BPM and, and of all the research was to really kind of sort of see what's going on here. I mean, is this thing that we call a BFRB one thing or, and if not, how can we make something meaningful of understanding why Jane Smith responds great to habit reversal and Susan Gilmore, you know, as, you know, doesn't get any response, right? Mm -hmm. and, and we've seen that too frequently. So to understand those differences um, in the big picture so that we can tailor things more appropriately. You know, that's amazing in thinking about um, where we have been and where we're at and where we're going to. I know, you know, I have a sibling with Trick and in the 80s, there was nothing in my little town. There was nothing and watching her struggle and watching my parents try to find something to support her was really challenging as a sibling. And um, and I've been fascinated as I've been looking at the different components of what's been reported thus far about the subtypes and the overlay of brain scan imaging and Dr. Passantini, your work as well. And as we're looking at where we have been with limited information and now where we're at, can you share more about what is pioneering and groundbreaking in the work that has been discovered thus far with BPMI? Um, I can I can answer that one. And I, 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 I like John's explanation or description of this, this um, Every time I hear it, I, it, it, I, I really like that. And I, I think it's, it's an important step. Um, I think what's groundbreaking and what we're trying to do is, you know, we've known a fair amount about the behavioral aspects. You know, when, when patients come in, you know, we can see what they're doing. We can, you know, we, we learn about the triggers. You know, what are some of the things that make you want to pick more? What are some of the things when you do pick that make you, that, feed, that, that reinforce the picking or make you want to pick more? What are different situations or emotions? We have some reasonable understanding of kind of what things look like on the surface. What we don't really know is exactly how all of these, these different features relate with each other. And what's going on underneath? Not that we're gonna be able to figure out the brain completely, but by marrying all of these measures and assessments that we did in BPI, looking at thoughts, feelings, behaviors, environmental factors, comorbid disorders, and then marrying this data with the genetic data that we have, that we've collected with the neuroimaging so we can actually see what areas of the brain are, are functioning or lighting up or involved with some of these more surface characteristics and as well as neurocognition doing neuropsychology tests we want to try to get a better understanding of how this stuff might work and it, can we go a little bit deeper into the symptoms and try to think in a, in a in a different way about how we can change the behaviors you know habit reversal changes by by having the person you know do something to not pull or pick if we can understand what's driving the urge maybe that might allow us to develop some more effective treatments. We're not there yet, that's still a ways off. We have so much data to look at and we have so much more research to do. BPMI is really a starting point to get us going in this area. And I think we've learned a lot, but, we, but it really is one step in a, in a process. It's, it's gonna take some time to do because we are so complicated as human beings that um, we, we, in three years, we can't, we, we can't completely figure all of this out. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit more about that and just what the process looks like? Because um, I think some folks feel like it's just as simple as someone walks in, there's an analysis, there's a diagnosis, and we move forward with a treatment. But this is a really complicated process of discovery and that leads to effective treatment. So can you talk a little bit more about the inner workings of the process itself? Well, I think part of the process is it, it, you know, the idea of somebody coming in and, and doing an evaluation, doing treatment, that hasn't always worked so well in the BFRBs. And that's why we're taking a step back. And what BPMI did was it's laying, sort of creating the scaffold. It's telling us where now can we target 
more effective treatments. So it's, it hasn't yet, it's not about treatment, but what it's telling us is, for example, when we found out essentially there were three types of trichotillomania. Now this is, this is kind of groundbreaking. We always knew there were differences, but we didn't know were there 17 types, were, were, you know, was there 2 million types? And so what we can do now is use that scaffolding of understanding these three types to start targeting treatment differently for type one versus type two, type three, by, as John has mentioned, marrying that uh, understanding of the types with better understanding of the genetics and the brain biology. Mm. So it's, it's the starting scaffolding. It's sort of like we're laying the sort of, I don't know anything about building, but <laughs> so this a metaphor is going to fall apart very quickly, but it's laying the, the ground groundwork for it. Understanding the brain biology and the genetics then starts putting the, the walls up and then we can start um, sort of finishing off the house, so to speak, with the treatment approach. So it is a multi-layered approach, but this is hugely important because this at least gives us a true evidence-based approach as opposed to me kind of looking at folks for years in clinic and sort of saying, ah, uh, you know, somebody else in Washington, D.C. kind of thing. And I don't know, you know. Mm -hmm. And so this is allowing us by collecting folks information from all over the country to really have a, a um, as I said, an evidence based approach that should allow ultimately for more effective treatments, dividing them based on what we're already starting to, uh, to know. Mm hmm. And so the, the subtypes are really pioneering in terms of understanding effective treatment pieces. And I think for people within the BFRB community, understanding that we have arrived at some analysis that allows us to look at that subtyping and a structure, then that leads to the treatment intervention. Is that right? Yeah. That is right. And that's okay. exactly what we're hoping it will do. And it will make us, I hope, much more sort of careful about, you know, not using a one size fits all treatment and really creating sort of, you know, based on what these types are telling us, as John mentioned about the driving forces, the triggers, the developmental psychology behind the subtypes. Mm -hmm. The other thing that we that we really benefit from that, that TLC and, the, and our benefit from is our scientific advisory board is 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 nicely balanced with um, expert researchers that, that do a lot of work in this area. And, and we also work in Tourette's and OCD and anxiety and depression. So we have models to do this work, this work on models that we've used in other with other types of disorders that are that are more commonly researched so we can apply to. BFRBs, but also um, we have a number of just master clinicians, people with so much experience, and we're using the BPMI data, the evidence base, and, and we um, are, will be meeting with the clinicians as well to see how this sounds to those with a lot of boots on the ground experience working with patients. We also have a number of treatments that, that do work for some individuals, some work for more, some work for less. So we don't need to reinvent the wheel. What we need to do is identify all of the different types of treatment approaches or interventions that we have, or maybe even specific pieces or parts of treatments. And now we can map these different parts of treatments onto the specific characteristics that we've identified in the subtypes. So rather than somebody coming in and, and getting kind of, we throw everything at them that we can and hope that something works, we're gonna be able to say, based on your profile, based on your subtype, we're gonna take this treatment component from, from A and this treatment piece from B, and we're gonna add this other piece over here from treatment C and put it together in a way that's really going to match match your profile. You know, it, saying, saying now that we, we, have, we have the locks, you know, every lock is different and now we have the keys, is probably going a little bit too far, but you know, in general, that's that's the type of, of, of approach that we're thinking about and that we're working towards. Mm -hmm. So knowing that, I guess I'm curious to know if either one of you through all of this data gathering have had that aha moment and what that aha moment has been.
I think the I think one of the aha moments was actually looking at the data when we first um, identified the subtypes, and and said, oh, this makes this makes a lot of sense. Um, I think we've had a couple of other aha moments when I was looking at I'm looking at the data related to impulsivity because we know that there's a lot of impulsive people report that pulling or picking it can be an impulsive behavior for some but not others, and looking at different patterns of impulsivity. Some people report that they pull because of, of kind of motor behavioral impulsivity, they're impulsive, they, they're, their hands move before they know what they're doing. Others pull because it's more of a cognitive impulsivity, they have a mm -hmm. hard time focusing and the pulling may serve to focus them. And then others may pull because of different kinds of, of other, other types of, of impulsivity or other kinds of psychological profiles. So, you know, we're just starting to really understand things that we might say, oh, I'm an impulsive puller. Well, that could be three or four different types of impulsive pulling. And I don't think we really understood that as well before. And each one of these types of impulsive pulling, you know, we would, we would want to address with a different type of a treatment or a different treatment component. So I think we can say that we're looking at so many different variables of like sensory factors mm -hmm. and, and emotional factors and behavioral factors family factors and each one of these things now we're hopefully going to be able to subdivide and move the pieces around to create these these subtypes and these targeted treatment approaches the way John was describing before. Mm -hmm. You know I think one of my I I, I probably I have aha moments mm -hmm. frequently that uh, then fizzle on me but I think <laughs> that one of the aha moments was when we started analyzing the brain imaging data mm. from the BPMI. And one of the, you know, it's again, there's lots of, of uh, sort of nuanced sort of garbly goop around how one analyzes this and why, but I think the, the take home message was that there's a large reward component that folks with BFRBs show in their brain um, compared to people that don't have BFRBs. Mm. What does that mean? It means that in, in some fundamental way, their sense of finding things rewarding and rewarding can be both pleasurable, but it can also be rewarding in terms of the removal of something unpleasant. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we found was that people with BFRBs really do process this concept of reward quite differently from folks who don't have BFRBs. Mm -hmm. And what that showed was essentially not unlike people who may have alcohol or drug addiction do. This is not to say that they're synonymous, but what it does tell us is, and I've learned this over time with patients, many people will say to me, you know, my picking feels just like it's kind of addictive. I hate to admit, mm. I like it. I like doing this. My family, I can't tell them, you know, I, you know, but I, I'm kind of embarrassed by saying this and I'm like, okay, I get it. You know, um, not everybody again, but some people, and we see that that registers in the brain that some people are finding this very rewarding. That may also tell us some of the things, as John mentioned, we can use existing treatments, but it may also give us insight into maybe what we do is use some existing treatments that have been used for other mm. mental health disorders. Mm -hmm. So we maybe what we start doing is borrowing some at least key components of the therapy from alcohol and drug addiction and including that as part of our overall comprehensive therapy approach to BFRBs. Mm -hmm. That you know, we tend to stay in silos and think, oh, you know, BFRBs are like OCD. So that's what we'll sort of go back and forth with OCD. And the reward um, uh, uh, data on brain imaging said, mm, that's maybe been useful, but maybe we need to check over and see what the folks in the alcohol and drug use world are doing, mm. that maybe we'll find more effective treatments or at least add-ons to add to what we're doing in therapy. So That's super fascinating. Um, would that also apply to, um, and I might not be saying this correctly, but pharmacological interventions? It may be, as okay. you know, I mean, uh, granted, we don't have amazingly great treatments for drug and alcohol, but we have many things that have worked, again, in groups of people with, with addictions. Mm -hmm. So maybe we need to be 
bringing some of those medications as well, at least applying them to certain people with BFRBs um, in the hopes that we're sort of addressing that reward issue and dampening it down so that people, when they pick, won't find it so rewarding and therefore it'll be easier to stop the behavior. Mm -hmm. You know, and in some of the other disorders that we that we work with, a combination, specific combinations of medication and therapy tend to work well. Mm. The combination works better than either one alone because the medication in some ways can facilitate or superpower the therapy by creating kind of a state in the brain or changing the brain slightly to be more receptive to the behavioral interventions. Maybe it reduces the urge just a little bit or it reduces the reward mm -hmm. from picking so that patients can then use the therapy to overcome the urges or resist the urges. So that would be the other really exciting thing by looking at the brain data, which may give us insights into some of the pharmacologic, the medications, mm -hmm. some of the behavioral data that we've collected can give us some ideas about the therapies that we can combine together. Um, there's a real, there's a potential synergy there that may be really helpful. And right now it's been hit or miss. You know, we, we really haven't been working with the very strong understanding of what's actually going on underneath the hood um, for the people that we're working with. Yeah. And with that in mind, I mean, if I, if I'm a person within the BFRB community and I am waiting with bated breath to know what the outcomes of BPMI are going to be and how they're going to be effective for me, where are we at? What comes next? What do I look for? How do I become empowered with information? Well, I think people in the community can rest assured that at least as a scientific group, we are moving forward. Now, it may not ever be as, as fast as people want. And, and I, you know, I can, you know, um, I can't do anything about that, sadly enough. I would love it tomorrow myself, but it's not there tomorrow. Um, but I think we are moving forward. And keep in mind that even though the BPM has, um, has laid this skeletal groundwork for things that will be moving forward, there is still other research going on mm. constantly in the BFRB research community. Mm. Now, granted, it's not at that level that BPMI was, but it's still moving forward. And so there's, there's lots of little hopeful pockets, I think, of research. It's all, it is all moving forward. It, it would be lovely if every day we had a big new announcement. Um, uh, it's not that, unfortunately, but uh, I, I would tell the community, we are doing it. We are working as fast as we can um, to try to get better approaches and better treatments. Thank you both for everything that you are doing and everything you have done to bring the research to this point to find really groundbreaking components um, that will lead eventually to more effective treatment. I know personally for me, I'm, I'm absolutely fascinated and very hopeful about the subtyping process. I think that that is research that um, will ultimately lead to those more effective interventions, personalized interventions. And, and I think if we all had a magic wand, life would be completely different, right? But in the process, we hold on to hope and we hold on to the future. And so, um, with that in mind, I mean, what comes next in the pipeline of BPMI? It sounds like we're on the precipice of wrapping up some of the data and moving into the treatment research. But can you talk a little bit more about where we're at? When we started in 2014 with the funding, 2016 started working in earnest on the research. And in 2022, where are we at and where do we go from here? Well, we um, are. Our original timelines, um, I believe, said that by from 2021 going into 2022, we would start looking at the treatment implications. And we are, we're pretty close to being on target mm, because it's great. Into 2022. We were slowed down by, um, by COVID for some aspects. So the genetics data, all the labs shut so nobody could really look at the genetics data you know around the, around the country around the world because of the pandemic and a lot of mm. our universities were also shut down and we weren't able to really work on the data as much but we um, were writing papers we're analyzing the data that's going to continue probably for years we have enough to really 
hmm. um, keep keep a lot of interested researchers very very busy um, looking at our data. We have we have so much. I mean, it, it's it's a very it's a really huge and very complicated data set. Mm -hmm. um, but we are now, I think, as John, as John said, we're, we're, we have been starting to talk about treatment implications, just as we've been describing here. And the Scientific Advisory Board for, for TLC Foundation for the coming year, our, our, our primary work is going to be looking at these data, both scientists and clinicians, and starting to see how these might influence or inform either to, to improve existing treatment approaches mm -hmm. or to, to, to spawn newer treatment approaches. And we're hoping with that work, then that will lead to potentially more, more, more grant applications or to develop or test new treatments. Some of this we can do on our own, um, but over the coming you know, period of time, we really do wanna start using these data to start working with new new treatments that will that will you know with the goal of developing more targeted and more effective treatments um so so that's going to be a really exciting time as well awesome well i wanted to again thank you both for making time to join us today this has been a very helpful and informative conversation we thank you for all you're doing in support of the bfrb community we thank you for crunching those billions of data points into making it something meaningful for the individuals who experience BFRBs and people who love and support them. Um, we look forward to another opportunity to visit in the future when we have updates. And in the meantime, thank you to the community for joining us today. And again, if you have any questions, please make sure to email them into info, I-N-F-O at BFRB.org. Happy BFRB Awareness Week 2021, everyone. Have a Thank great you. day. Thank you.